Hi, everyone. I'm Ronnie Vargas Didvent, Executive Director of the Center for Women in Law. Thank you for joining us today. As many of you know, the Center is a national resource for women lawyers, and our mission is to generate lasting change within the legal profession. And we do that through a variety of programs, including our Ex Libra series. Um, and so today, we're very fortunate to have another installment of that series with Eve Rotsky, who is the author of um, Fair Play, uh, a game-changing uh, solution for when you have too much to do and more life to live. And this is a, a New York Times bestseller. We're very um, excited to welcome Eve here with us today. Um, Eve Rotsky is a lawyer um, and uh, she was a graduate of Harvard Law School. Uh, worked in uh, foundations and mediation. Uh, she has uh, three children and still managed to write a best-selling uh, book and has a lot to say about this topic. So Eve, let's just dive right in and talk about um, first a little bit about your background. As I mentioned, you graduated from Harvard. Um, you worked for JP Morgan at their foundation, but can you talk a little bit about um, your work in mediation and, and kind of what led you to this passion project. Well, thank you. Uh, and like I, I was saying to you earlier, Ronnie, I really appreciate you having me. Uh, this is my favorite audience because my goal is uh, to promote women in power um, in the legal profession. And we are not in, in the rooms necessarily where, where the decisions happen yet in the way I want us to be. So thank you for having me. Uh, and I believe a lot of that has to do with my topic. Uh, unpaid labor. And how did I get into this topic? Well, uh, you know, I, th I think psychologists call research me search um, <laughs> because this was a personal issue for me. Um, I write about this in Fair Play that all of my 10 years of research, uh, I did not set out to be a gender division of labor expert. I started as an M&A attorney and uh, moved into a career as a philanthropic advisor where my specialty is to work for families like the HBO show Succession. And everyone here should feel bad for me. Um, they're similar to your clients, I'm sure, but um, it's interesting work to combine tax law and governance into a practice that also deals with organizational management and family dynamics. So that is my day job. I did that work for the JP Morgan private bank, and then I moved to my own firm um, and I've had a very robust set of clients. And then um, at the same time though, uh, things were happening to me at the home front. And in 2011, I received a text from my husband, Seth, that said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And so I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries uh, was a text that changed my life, Ronnie. And uh, I'll just unpack it before we get into our conversation. Yeah. So everybody here can understand what was happening to me. I, I write about it in Fair Play, but not in this detail, but I think it's important given what we've gone through in the past year. I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries was a text that came in. I was already texting and driving. This was 10 years ago. I live in Los Angeles now, um, so we don't take traffic lightly. So I was racing to pick up my older son, Zach, at his toddler transition program, because in America, you know, we value childcare. That's sarcastic. Those programs last seven minutes and they take your entire salary. Um, I am surprised you didn't get blueberries. Also happened, as I was racing, um, I had a, a breast pump and a diaper bag in the passenger seat of my car. I had gifts for a newborn baby to return in the back seat of my car. Um, I had a client contract on my lap because I don't know about you out there, but I still do everything analog. I print everything out and I mark up by pen. And so I remember I had a pen in between my legs, Ronnie. And every time I would hit a stop sign on the way to get my older son, um, the pen would sort of stab me in the vagina. So I will say that was sort of the, the, the metaphor for that day. I was just sort of being stabbed in the vagina by a pen, uh, being chided for being, if not being the fulfiller of the smoothie needs for my husband. Um, my breasts were feeling engorged because I was, had to run home and feed my baby. And I had a client contract that still had to go out that day. So that, that was the chaos um, that did not get better over the pandemic. Um, but two thirds or more of what it takes to run a home and family fall on women, regardless of whether we work outside the home. And it even gets worse if we're the primary breadwinner. And so that was a statistic that I was 
undeniably living at the time, but I didn't even know. I didn't even know. And so I call myself the ghost of Christmas future because I'm here to, if you are, um, you know, anywhere in the next generation of lawyers here, um, I'm here to be your ghost of Christmas future to say that I did not have the career marriage combo I thought I was going to have. And so finally, the last two things I will say was I had the privilege for this not to happen to me. Privilege one was I was from a single mother household. And so when I would help my mother with eviction notices, late utility bills, from seven years old, I vowed I would have an equal partner in life. I vowed. That was a goal of mine. Two, I married that equal partner. Um, it did not end up that way, even though I'm literally, as you so beautifully said, I'm a Harvard trained mediator. I'm literally trained to use my voice. And so I figured if I had those two privileges and I still couldn't bring domestic uh, equity to my home, that probably other women were uh, afflicted by this as well. And that's what I found. I found in 17 countries, uh, unpaid labor is the last frontier of feminism, ironically sitting right next to us in our homes. And let's let's talk about that research because um, I think in the book you do a, a fantastic job of laying out not just the problem before us but historically what has gone on, and and I want to remind everyone you wrote this before 2020, so before right. the pandemic really brought all of this to light and said, aha, all along um, there's been this really unequal balance of work, and um, and I think it's just fascinating. So talk about that research, and then I want to talk with you about why the perception of the problem may be different uh, men and women. I think, well, I, and also the perception of the problem, I think within households and, yeah. you know, I, 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 I'll put my little, I learned to use all these fun things, but, you know, private lives are public issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important as lawyers and, and um, why I think we're the uniquely suited to su solve this problem is because um, I, I, this is a behavioral design issue and there's nobody better at designing societal behaviors than lawyers. Um, we get people to stop at stop signs um, because we pass laws that say that people have to do it, right? We get people not to vote because we pass voter restriction laws. I mean, there's a lot of ways that lawyers, um, you know, we are setting the behavior design for society. So um, what is the research? Well, I will say, what, so I got to go to Davos last year, which was, well, you know, 2019 or the beginning of 2020, where I probably got COVID or that either there or this other place because I came home really sick. But um, when I was there, Ronnie, this was January, I had the, you know, I, I, people were confused why I'm still talking about unpaid labor because they're saying, well, in the US, women are um, gainfully employed more than men. Our labor force participation rates were higher than men um, when I went to Davos. And um, and I remember thinking, you know, how precarious because every single piece of research I had read started to make me realize that um, our labor force participation rate was extremely precarious. And I had this one conversation with a German politician who was trying to make things more equitable in the south of Germany. And I remember he said something very fascinating to me. He said, Eve, you don't have to legislate against women. Um, if you want them not to be in the places of power in your society, all you have to do is require kids come home for lunch. That was what they, that's what they do in the South of Germany and in Munich and the surrounding areas. Um, it's getting better. But I was like, I still get chills from that comment because I remember feeling the same thing that it just takes one, one emergency, one thing. And then we're gonna watch women's labor force participation rates um, collapse because we have not changed our definition of work as the ideal structure, which has been designed solely for men, white, hetero, cisgender men, but we expect women to still raise children. So at my friend, Amy Westerfeld's famous quote, we expect women to work as if they don't have children and to uh, parent as if they don't work. And I knew that that was precarious. And so when the global pandemic hit and we watched labor force participation rates drop to 1988, when I was you know, 12 years old, um, I knew that this was not 
inevitable. Every law article, every article kept saying inevitably, this women are going to shoulder house care, housework and childcare. And I was here to say, this is not inevitable. This is fucking inevitable. We have designed societies on the backs of the unpaid labor of women and when paid the undervalued labor of domestic workers. And I said, I will not ever keep my mouth shut. I will devote my life, the rest of my life to trying to right this wrong. Well, and, and you, you really lay this out. And I just wanted to share a couple of things that um, we have fabulous interns at the center and they, um, one of them helped me with this uh, data set. Mothers are more than three times as likely as fathers to be responsible for most of the household labor during the COVID-19 pa pandemic. And despite this, 72% um, of fathers think they are splitting labor equally. And you talk about this in the book, this idea of um, the invisible workload, right? The invisible labor that goes on behind the scenes. And you have some, some both amusing and angering anecdotes in your own life about crawling around the floor trying to get things done in the household after hours, right? So after a lot of times um, when our partners go to bed, um, there's all these things that continue to happen and they're invisible and they don't count. And so can you talk about the perception of um, that fairness? Because one of the other quotes, you had a great quote in your book, resentment stems from perceived unfairness. And so you have already a setup for conflict and problems. Uh, absolutely. And so I think this is where the danger is, Ronnie, because it's why, again, why I love speaking to lawyers, because not only are we the behavior designers of society, but we are um, we are STEM to understand uh, systemic issues. Um, and I think that the biggest problem with the home is people really genuinely felt like they were divorcing over a glue stick as one man in White Plains said to me, I genuinely thought my marriage was collapsing over um, off season blueberries. <laughs> and so what I'm here to say is the home is dangerous because these are, these are systemic big issues. And so we'll unpack them, but, but, but I do wanna talk about how they play out because um, if you are partnered, you know these issues. Uh, I'm sure you've had a sponge in the sink argument, um, but, but I think even if you aren't, um, to recognize that if you are in a generation where you're not partnered yet and you are a woman or an ally of women um, or a leader that's designing workplaces for women, this is the fundamental issue for why I believe women are not in seats of power, why we have just 18 women out of the 500 highly, most highly compensated CEOs in America. So um, what happened to me? Well, after that Blueberries Day, um, I started to research this issue and I think um, what, what I found, and this is, I'll show you here, right? The, um, turns out that the, 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 what I call the default being the default for every single household and domestic tasks, I call it the she fault. Um, it, it has a name. It actually has many names, actually. We've been talking about these issues for a um, hundred years, even though I will say, and I will call out Harvard, you did not teach me these issues not in family law, not in any of my seminars. I never learned um, about these and I wish that we had. And that's why Ronnie, thank you for, for being who you are. Um, but the second shift, we know that from Arlie Hochschild, we may have, you may have heard the term emotional labor. Um, you know, the, these, these mental load is, is another term that has been used of late. But my favorite actually is a term from 1986. Uh, the, the term is called uh, invisible work. As you just said, Ronnie, it's coined by a sociologist named Arlene Kaplan Daniels. And her argument was that the reason why uh, childcare and housework is not in the GDP, um, that was again, back to the, it's freaking inevitable, right? Um, is because women do it. It's because we have been uh, conditioned to accept and to benefit from a structure where and this is part of the idea of what a patriarchy is, that not only are, are men in power, but women are designed to support that power by uh, bringing the kids home for lunch, right? Doing unpaid labor. Um, and so that, that is what I learned that we've been actually talking about this for a really long time. And why I like that term so much was because um, in, in my type A life, Ronnie, I just figured, well, um, I can solve this because I'm just going to make the invisible visible to Seth. And so um, I, I started to compile 
uh, from women like you, nine months, uh, nine, nine, 98 tabs in an, a beautiful Excel sheet, because that's where everything always starts for me in Excel. I made a giant list uh, of everything I did and the women I talked to did that took more than two minutes of invisible work. Um, the, the list grew and grew and grew. Um, so much, it was so granular. I, I sent it to a friend and she said, Eve, you forgot Elf on the Shelf. And I said to her, nope, you got to just, you don't know how to use Excel. You have to sc scroll to tab 72. If you go to tab 72, there's a tab called Magical Beings. If you scroll down underneath Santa and above Lucky Leprechaun, you will see Elf on the Shelf. And then the, I sort of made a graphic so you can see, this is my, should I do spreadsheets? And um, I can't show you all the tabs, but it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing um, for nine months to the point where I finally sent it off to Seth. And um, uh, as you can imagine, I used all my mediation skills uh, and uh, that's a sarcastic again. I just sent him the 19 million megabyte spreadsheet um, and said, can't wait to discuss. <laughs> and, um, I didn't even get a word response. I just got that. So I think what I'm here to say to you is that really early on, I learned that lists alone don't work. And then what I could do as an organizational manager was I asked Ronnie the most important question that I asked in, in the last 10 years. The, literally the most important question I asked in the last 10 years in my research, because you asked about the research, was this question. What if we treated our homes as our most important organizations? Um, that they weren't gendered, that we didn't disrespect them because women were doing all the work. I knew it wouldn't look the way they did now, right? Where we wait to take the dog out, right? When it's about to take a piss on the rug. Or um, we wait to set the table when we're already hangry and cranky. Even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group has more clearly defined expectations in the home. You don't bring snack twice to that group and you're out. Um, and that's, so that, that was how I started to think about the systems issues, the systems failures in this particular organization, in the particular home organization. And, and Eva, I thought that what you do a great job of too is talking about the sort of um, the toxicity sometimes that we let in, these sort of toxic messages, because for a lot of um, particularly for professional women, we think we're really above these types of, you know, these things we're educated. We, um, we know what we, how to manage time. We know how to manage tasks and projects. So why are we having these problems in our home? And you talk a lot about toxic messages and not only that we may hear from society or our partners, but also that we tell ourselves about our time and what we can do and the notion of making time. So can you address that a little bit? Absolutely. And so I think I, I struggled with this a lot, why I decided to write to women. Um, my mother, she's a professor of social change at Hunter College School of Social Work. And she kept asking me, why are you writing to women, right? Why write to the oppressed? Why not write to the oppressor? Um, and what happened was, um, if I could just write to the oppressor or just come in with what fair play became, which is a system, and we'll talk about that. This is a system for dividing up domestic life that was based on the should I do spreadsheet, but has become a system that has now been beta tested by thousands and thousands of couples. Um, before I could get to that, I realized I had to write to women because of um, something really important, which became the, the, the tenant of fair play. And that is uh, how we um, value and treat women's time in, in our society. And I'll tell you why, because I, I do things, as I told you, analog. I have moleskin after moleskin where I collect you know, my, my data. Um, and one of my favorite signs, one of my favorite shorthands kept being in, in now 10 years of research, C-I-Y-O-O. -O. And C-I-Y-O-O -O was my shorthand for complicit in your own oppression. And we are women are complicit in our own oppression. And that's because of patriarchy, right? But but the reason the way it plays out in this particular area is really dangerous. And I'll tell you how. So we know that as a society that we treat and value men's time as if it's finite, like diamonds. And we treat women's time as if it's infinite, like sand. That is something we know because if women enter a male profession, salaries 
automatically go down. We know that we say things in our society like breastfeeding is free. Um, not if we cared about women's time. But the place that Sorry, was most- I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, my watch wants to hear us too. Um, <laughs> but the, the most insidious was what were women were saying to themselves. So when I started out to do the research of Fair Play 10 years ago, um, I asked women, why? Why are you the one picking up the phone call when your kid is sick at school? Why are you the one who is um, filling out, you know, the AYSOs logging onto the school form portal? Um, why are you the one that is um, buying your partner a tuxedo for a wedding and bl he's blaming you because you don't have any, uh, he doesn't have any clothes. Um, so again, right now, I just want to caveat this, right? I am, we are celebrating all family structures, but I am centering the hetero cisgender norms right now for a reason, um, because that's where the problems lie. Um, so what happens is that we as women uh, who are married to men start saying things like, um, well, um, I do this because my husband makes more money than me. Mm -hmm. I do this because my job is more flexible. So let's just play for that for a second. Seth started to make money for me because my job became more flexible, because I couldn't do it all. And so it's a cycle. It doesn't just happen that we make less money. There's a gender pay gap where we are obviously paid less. Uh, Latinx women are paid 50 cents on the dollar for every uh, non-Latinx uh, white man. Um, we, are, we are paid less. So of course we're going to be making less money. So I cannot justify saying because I chose philanthropy and my husband chose private equity, that that's the reason I should be holding all the domestic work for my household because it's a chicken and the egg. We have to throw the time is money argument out. Other women said to me, my job is more flexible. So I went to the research. It turns out if a woman is a doctor and a man's a lawyer, ta-da, her job is more flexible. Woman's a lawyer, man is a doctor, guess what? Ta-da, her job is more flexible. Um, I heard other women saying to me, I pick up the children from the school, oh, you know, I do everything because um, uh, I'm a better, I'm wired differently from multitasking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was mine. I prided myself on being a great multitasker, helping my mother since I was seven. I could do it all, having it all meant doing it all. Um, that's a fallacy. And in fact, when I went to a neuroscientist, one of the top Harvard neuroscientists in America and said, um, are women better multitaskers? Are we wired differently for care? Um, I don't write about this in the book because he didn't approve the off the record comment. But of course his on the record comment was there's no um, gendered difference and how we multitask. But he looked at me off the record and said, Eve, why are you asking me this? And I said, because I want to debunk this. I have so many women saying to me that they're better multitaskers, that they're wired differently somehow for this care. And he's like, well, do I as a man really want you to debunk this? Because somehow we've convinced you women that you're better at wiping asses and doing dishes. And how great for my tenure and my leisure time. I'm not sure. And, and I don't even get blamed for it because my wife takes pride in it. So I started crying in his office. I mean, he was being sarcastic and funny, but it, it triggered me so deeply, Ronnie, that I, 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 I started to cry in his office. And it was, such, it was a very hard couple months to deal with that conditioning and unlearning for me particularly. Um, cause I had taken pride in that in the wiping of the asses and doing of the dishes. And then finally, the most common was in the time it takes me to tell him, her, they, what to do, I should do it myself for that one. I unpacked it with a behavioral economist called Dan Ariely, who said, that's a classic devaluing of women's time. Of course you want to involve someone in wiping the asses and doing the dishes early. Otherwise that's present value issue. You're going to be doing it forever into the future. You're devaluing your future time. So I'm here to and tell you that. I mean, and the weird thing is we know that when we, it comes to our children, because 
the same logic applies to our children, right? Of course, it takes longer to teach them tasks, but the idea is we want them to be independent and to be able to own those tasks and do them themselves. But we don't often apply that, you know, we think, or we fall into this trap, which you also address in your book that we, we are better at this. We, um, we have higher standards and we want them done to these standards. And you address that point as well. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's, 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 it's so, um, insidious because again, like I said, we we've designed a society to be built on the backs of the unpaid labor of women. So we have to be complicit in our own oppression. And so there's only a couple ways to do that. Like I said, to take the pride, to think we have higher standards, to tell us ourselves that we should convince ourselves we should do it because the other person uh, won't or it, it's not efficient. So we, 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 it's not that I'm blaming women, of course. I'm just saying that I'm angry for us. And so I remember I had this one man, because fair play really does become a love letter to men. Um, I had one man say to me, I'm willing to accept the female anger of the beginning part of your book because the system has been very helpful for me and my partner. So I DM'd him back and I said, thank you for accepting female anger. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, 2018 was the, the, the age of rage. And I think now it's the age of solutions. And I do, I am excited for us to dive into what fair play is. Um, and I, but I just want to honor the chat because I didn't get to see it. And so I like to look through it and thank you, Jen, for saying I'm a primary breadwinner and primary caregiver. Yes, it is very common. I see you um, and, and I see so many women who are you. And so I just want to say thank you for sharing. And and um, Eve, before we get into, because I, I want to talk about, we sort of framed the problem and we talked about how you created the list and I want to talk about your roles. But before we move on, you, you did mention that we're talking about sort of um, heteronormative couples. Um, one of the things your research found was that this, this sort of spans socioeconomic groups as well, racial groups as well. So when we think about... Um, the problem of this unpaid labor, it's, it, it spans all of these groups, right? So whether you are um, uh, a person of color uh, or if you are um, a, a white couple um, and whatever your means are, and this is what I thought was most interesting too, that you can't earn your way out of this problem in terms of your salary or your socioeconomic status. It seems to be across the board. Absolutely. And I think that's been the main problem is that there's been so many tech apps and people are looking at this sort of as a solution of just outsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you may have heard that right over your career, you know, you want to be a good delegator, you want to be a good outsourcer. The problem with that language is um, it's highly uh, toxic, I believe, because it, it, it's sort of the boss bitch, bitch feminism, where it's still on your own shoulders to handle this right without um, including systemic issues or men. And the other issue is that somehow it um, presumes that you're going to be outsourcing to other women. And often it's women of color um, who are undervalued and underpaid. So I, I do not like the term outsourcing. We'll talk about the term I love, which is CPE, and why I really focus on the cognitive labor as the issue to solve the, this, these problems um, and the political movement that I hope you'll all join with us. Um, but, but, but yes, I, I do think that the, the main issue has been for me, just how pervasive this issue is. Uh, Oxfam tracks uh, the gender division of labor globally. And now we're at $10.9 trillion of unpaid labor a year that women do. Um, it's particularly har horrible and toxic in India and Japan. Um, and we know that because labor force participation rates are low and we get um, studies uh, out of Oxfam and other organizations that focus on women's economic security there. Um, but I will say that even in the Nordic countries that always feel sort of vaguely racist that we always uh, point to the Nordic countries as the, our, our, um, our gold standard, not, not better there either. Not from my standards. And we'll talk about how I measure invisible work, um, but no, nobody's doing it right. So I think, you know, I invite us all here as the be behavior designers of, our, of America to uh, join a political movement together because this is going to take a collective reckoning that no, we're not going to do it all. No, men um, are going to have to do ch child care and housework. I call it the just fucking do it campaign. You know, it's like our new Nike. And um, it's time. It's time for this reckoning 
to be um, outed in, in a way that can hopefully help society. So yeah, I, that's, that's my political speech. And um, of course, I do want to talk practically about how this can help individuals in their homes. But I think it's important to recognize the context for how we're talking today. And I like the way you frame your solution too. In the book, you talk about um, we can't excuse not doing something on our in our own household on an individual basis because we're waiting for a societal fix, right? That it really does start at a micro level to make those changes happen. So why don't we start with um, the rules? Because I love um, how you start with changing the rules of the game. And, um, and your first one is all time is created equal. And uh, one of your great quotes in the book is demanding time equality and time choice, which I thought is an important thing as well, is a message the women's movement missed. So can we talk about how all time is created equal? Absolutely. So thank you for having great lead up because we just talked about all the reasons how we we society and uh, our, we ourselves devalue women's time. So I think we can uh, go on to rule two pretty easily because it's pretty easy. I'm here to tell you that you know, we're not Albert Einstein. Uh, we can't mess with the space-time continuum. We can't find time. We only get 24 hours in a day. And I will say that while my should I do spreadsheet didn't work for Seth, when I had this aha moment that <clears throat> time choice had been missed by, by the, the women's movement, I realized that that was my issue. I didn't need couples therapy for a hundred years. I just needed Seth to afford me the same time choice that he gets in a day. And so when I said to him, you know, you have four hours after our kids go to bed to check sports center, work out, um, finish a PowerPoint deck, whereas I'm doing things in service of our home until the minute my head hits the pillow at midnight, that's fundamentally unfair. And I'm not going to live like that anymore. And so I deserve as much time choice over my day as you have. And if you have four hours of time choice, I want four hours of time choice. If that means that you only have three hours of time choice, so I get an hour of time choice back, then that's what's going to have to happen. And so it was that it was a fundamental change in me that allowed me to bring the system to bear because I had to value my own time as diamonds. But Ronnie, that's hard. That's hard when you're conditioned um, in a patriarchy because I was guarding Seth's time in a million years, 10 years ago, it never would have occurred to me to ask Seth to take the kids to school. I never would have bothered him. I always started my work day late because he had to start his early. He had to get his workout in. I was guarding, guarding, guarding his time um, as if it was diamonds. So that's what I mean. I mean, your time is diamonds out there um, and you deserve as much time choice as your male counterparts. And I'm talking to women who are unpartnered too, because if you're at a law firm like I was, and I was always tasked to write these memos to file when my um, male colleagues were getting billable, um, visible work. Um, no, we have to, we have to protect our boundaries and say no to that as well. And I think that's a good point. We had some questions come up about setting those boundaries at work. How do you say no? How do you really carve out and say, this is priority work. And so I want priority work. And I, and I think too, there's been a lot of um, talk, which was pre-pandemic, about the invisible workload that women take on at the office in traditional roles like planning parties or making sure that, um, you know, the uh, uh, staff appreciation gets done or all of those things that um, are seen as not worth men's time. Absolutely. And by the way, uh, twice as likely, Harvard Business Review, uh, we just wrote about this, where women are twice as likely to uh, be asked to do non-promotable tasks um, and maybe even higher now. Um, and if you're a woman of color, um, that, that's even worse. And, and, and you get penalized um, as a one-off if you do protect your time. That's why I said this has to be a political movement um, where to me, I call myself a care feminist, which is um, I believe in the value of care. I believe in parenting out loud. And I believe that the invisible work is the most important work we will do as a society. And once we get there, um, that's how we get, that's how men will do it. And so that's why I say, you know, this is, I, I'm really centering single mothers, especially single mothers of color here, because we don't, single mothers of color don't have the, um, the luxury of opting out of the workforce. They don't have the luxury of these 
uh, gaps in unpromotable tasks and in pay gap. And so, um, and, and surprise, last big stat I'll talk to you before we get into how we get men involved, um, how I've seen men become part of this movement, how we will apply in our households. I've seen that um, uh, the, the sort of the toxic nature of the pay gap, which was shocking to me, is that um, 70, 75, 70 to 75 percent of the pay gap between men, men and women is actually discrimination against mothers. Yeah, and and you yeah. you mentioned that in your book that the there's a larger gap between mothers and non mothers than between men and women, and that can be sort of shocking to hear. the um, the The mommy tax is real. There is a real penalty um, for parent, you know, parenting for women. Absolutely, it is it is um, shocking to me. Two stats that shocked me were that men, on average, do five to fifteen hours a week less less childcare and housework once children come along. Yeah. Which was a hundred percent what happened in my household. Things were very fair until that first child came. We would order dinner at each other. We'd each do each other's laundry. That went away. And it is a, it is a scientifically proven stat. Men and hetero cisgender relationships do less. Um, and then the other thing that shocked me, of course, was just how much we hate mothers in society how much of the penalization, you know, the, the penalty of, of our gendered pay gap is because we assume women are doing all the unpaid labor. Right. Um, and there was an amazing man in Texas actually, who got very famous for, he was a, a doctor who said, um, you know, women can, should never be paid as much as men because they would never work the hours men do um, because of all their other responsibilities. So again, it's why, I think I, I, what keeps me up at night is single mothers of color because, you know, what, what do you do? What do you do when you're already afforded a 50% um, decrease in, in your salary to start? Um, and then you're on top of it, you have all the childcare and housework. So um, that, that's why you know, the policies, flexibility, um, predictable flexibility, the things we'll talk about later, I think um, are the key. And that's why I keep saying this is, uh, we can't, I can't do this alone, obviously. Um, I never, I'm joining a, a big group of women, uh, care feminists who do value uh, care, including Anne-Marie Slaughter, Ai-Jen Poo, uh, Brencia Berry at Plus. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is a political movement. And of course it has to involve men as well. And, and Eve, we got it. We did get a question in the chat about how how do we bring men along? And I think you you answered that question in the book about how, very specifically about how to begin these conversations. Let's do it. Yeah, and as I, a mediator, I, you provide some really helpful language let's for exactly it. how to start those conversations. Absolutely, so, let's yeah. do it. Um, I okay. think let's let's jump in. We have twenty minutes. Um, we're getting questions, which is amazing. Um, and I see the Q and A, and I will jump right into your. I feel like our Q and A set us up um, for a perfect a segue into um, into what we want to talk about, because actually anonymous Q and a, uh, one of the most interesting things men said to me. Um, and now again, I've, I've thousands of data points of men. Um, but, but what men said to me, uh, was my, my wife does all these unnecessary things. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's why there was no buy-in. So let's talk about how we get out of these tropes. Um, cause there's a secret formula actually. And so um, we're going to talk about the secret formula. And that's this formula of boundary systems and communication. So we just did boundaries. That was that's basically the, the, the four rules of, of fair play um, are here to, to, to really set up your boundaries. And those the rules that we addressed were rule one, which is all time is created equal. Um, rule two and three are really about starting where you are now. Um, and, and rule four is, is looking at sort of values and we'll talk about how we, that happens in our systems and communication. So let's talk about the secret formula. So boundaries, we just talked about. I could not do this um, without, I could not do this without, um, um, with, without recognizing how valuable my own time was. And so that is, I'm here to tell you all time is di diamonds. That's the true boundary. I'm so sick of being on these panels with men, pale and male men who say things like, 
Um, I'm a productivity expert and you have to have two untouchable days a week. So women on average in the pandemic, um, and this did not just apply to hetero cisgender women, all women were being interrupted about three minutes in every 42 seconds if you have children. So don't tell me about my two untouchable days. That's, <laughs> these are, these are um, you know, advice for, for, for I, the ideal worker structure and a patriarchy. I don't believe in that. So the boundary is, is our time is diamonds. But let's talk about the system because that gets the, all the unnecessary things. Okay, so what is fair play? Fair play is a metaphor. It's an actual card game because as a mediator, I've seen real benefits in gamifying hard conversations, difficult conversations. But it's, it's a metaphor to um, address the, the hundred tasks of the home and, and who does what. It is not a scorekeeping exercise. So it is not, otherwise it would be a list. It's not you hold meals, weekday breakfast, I hate you, or you deal with school lunches, right? It's a system. So what do I mean by a system? A system is a, a place where you have explicitly defined expectations, you know your role, and there's fairness and transparency. To get to that system, you can't just have a list. You have to think about the onboarding, the buy-in. And that's where men were getting off the hook. Well, I'm not gonna buy into the system because the train has already taken off without me. So let me tell you about the second most important question I asked in the past, um, in the past uh, 10 years that actually gets to the entire crux of the system. And that is, um, how did mustard get in your refrigerator? <laughs> and I asked this to polyamorous couples. I asked this to LGBTQIA couples, uh, hetero cisgender couples, and seven, these are all uh, different family structures and seven roommates, 17 countries. And this is what I would hear often. I would hear, um, well, I'm the one who um, knows my second son, Johnny, likes French's yellow mustard with his uh, protein. Otherwise, he chokes. That's why mustard's in the refrigerator. So, Ronnie, I know that from organizational management, that's, a con that's conception. That's actually a very important piece of why we're paid is to conceive of new ideas and new things. Um, so I would write down conception. And then I would hear, oh yeah, um, well, yeah, I have to monitor the mustard for when it's running low and get stakeholder buy-in from my family for what they need on the grocery list. Um, okay, that that's uh, planning. They didn't actually say stakeholder buy-in, but that's what I heard. And finally, um, I would hear, oh yeah, and then I send, my partner to the store um, and he, they couldn't even pick up um, the right type of mustard. They bring home sp spicy Dijon every freaking time. And Eve, you want me to trust my partner with my living will? Well, that's not gonna happen because they can't even bring home the right type of mustard. So I might as well just do everything myself. And then we're back into the cycle, the cycle of organizational failure. The two things that are missing from our home organizations right now are accountability and trust. And from so many women, I hear from them, I cannot give over these tasks because they won't get done or they won't be done to the standard I need them to get done. That is just a you telling me that there's not accountability and trust in your organization. Because if you have an employee that doesn't do a task on time or doesn't deliver to you, they go on probation and they're probably fired. But you can't do that in your home. And so it leads to these very bizarre um, standards and dynamics that end up uh, forcing women out of the workforce. So how do you, what is fair play? It just rectifies that. It rectifies that with ridiculous systems failure by recognizing that when you hold a card, you're holding it with the full conception, planning and execution. Because the conception and planning, what is called in science, the cognitive labor, the mental load is the thing I care most about. It is what is keeping women up at night. It's what's pushing them out of the workforce. It's what's giving them autoimmune diseases. It's the reason why we are diagnosed uh, twice as likely to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder as men. The cognitive labor, the unencumbered mind that Virginia Woolf talked about is what I wanna give to you and the only way we can do that is onboarding into a place 
where our partners, if we're lucky enough to have them or our community, recognizes the value of the conception and planning. And so I'll give you a quick example. My Seth, we started with extracurricular sports, Ronnie. He would say, <laughs> I take our kids, um, I'm responsible for um, sports, extracurricular sports. That's one of the cards. Um, and I would say to Seth, when we finally understood this, when I started to design the system, thank you for thinking you're in charge of extracurricular sports. We're going to the Little League field on Saturdays. But here's the 25 things that's happening in the conception and planning. Conception, I'm serving my kids for what sport they want to play and what friends they want to play with. Planning, I'm signing them up on an AYSL portal that keeps crashing on me. Um, I am Xeroxing five copies of their birth certificates. I'm filling out consent forms. I'm driving those consent forms to a weird office that's always closed. I'm on an 85 person carpool text chain to get them to their carpool. Um, I'm bringing water and sunscreen to the park um, and we're getting there on time. And so once Seth started to understand, oh my God, there is a lot of conception and planning that goes to the execution. Him taking that one task over one, out of a hundred. So we started really small because our uh, there was so much unfairness in my household. We started so small, but just that one card um, got me six hours of my week back, six hours of my week back um, from that one change in our household. And so of course, this is 10 years in the planning. We are dumping all this unlearning on you in 45 minutes, but what but but the system is is predicated on an ownership mindset. Yeah, and Eve, can you talk about, as people think about the un, the idea of this unnecessary work, right? Or, the you know, you don't have to do it like that. Uh, you lay out specifically in your book how to get past that. And that's that idea, and this will definitely appeal to all the lawyers, this idea of minimum standard of care, right? So you have to agree on what it takes to actually successfully own that card. And you gave a great example, maybe you'll share it with us about um, the color wars at camp. Oh my gosh, yes. Well, I think that became the biggest piece, right? Um, I'm just looking at it here. I'm just laughing because I'm seeing the minimum standard of care right here. So that all sounds fine and good, right? The ownership mindset sounds fine and good. And I, I thought I solved the problem, Ronnie. I was like, that's it. Light bulb moment, CPE, conception, planning, execution, Seth gets it. But still, um, things weren't changing in my household. Just that alone. And so I, you know what I realized? I realized that the expectation of money allows us not to go into our boss's office and say, hey, what should I be doing today? I'll just wait here till you tell me what to do. <laughs> we do learn to figure it out. So I assumed you know, Seth does ownership mindset and work. So this will just be seamlessly integrated into the home. But no, I ended up having to write a 350 page book about it because I really wanted the card game just to sit on the cards against humanity shelves. But it doesn't work that way. The system is unfortunately more complicated. It's a more of an investment, but it's the best investment you'll ever make in your career. It's the best investment you'll ever make in your life. And that is systems take onboarding. So you know the system, the predication, the, it's predicated on ownership mindset. That's when you get there, it is seamless. Seth and I are there now. Um, we are in a very different place than we were when I was um, crying on the side of the road over off-season blueberries. But the way you get there is you start to have these conversations about the minimum standard of care. Now, minimum standard of care is something that I designed that was the opposite of what I'd been hearing up to date which is lower your standards. That was the only advice I was hearing for women um, mm -hmm. in my field, lower your standards. And I'm telling you, Ronnie, you, the stories, you can't make this shit up. I mean, there was a knife in the car seat of my friend who's married to a chef. And I said, so what, what so her standards should be that he should throw her, her child into a car seat that has a paring knife in it. So the point is, no, we don't need to lower our standards, but we do need to understand uh, and I, who knew my torts 101 class would ever come in, in handy? I think I like got a C minus in, in, in torts. I didn't understand at all why that was a relevant class to me, but it became the most relevant because the idea of a reasonable person is something that works really well in the household. The idea of a minimum standard of care. What would a reasonable person do? What is a, reason, a minimum standard of care that we could both agree on? So how does that work in practice? Again, I'll give you just another quick example of my life. Ownership mindset, 
Seth understood it. He understood that he held held the garbage card. Garbage had uh, the liner had to go back in. The bins had to go back out. You know, it's more complicated in LA uh, than New York, where just to go in the incinerator. Um, so he understood the CPE of garbage. But I was still his garbage shadow, Ronnie. I was following him in the kitchen. I was staring at him, seeing if the garbage was going to go out, having a you know panic attack over over, over garbage and and. That's when Seth's like this ownership mindset thing's not working because you're not giving me any space to, to own it. And I said, well, I also see that the garbage is piling up. So we were, we were at an impasse. And that's where I realized that the step you can't miss, and it's the biggest step that, that is between successful couples in the system and ones that have used it as a list and it has been as, as successful, is investing in the conversations of what your minimum standard of care is for each and every one of these cards for meals for school lunch? Is it signing up for the hot lunch at school? Is it a, 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 power, a tiger's milk bar, which is what I used to pack myself as a kid and an apple? Is it a quinoa Elsa pancake? Which hopefully it's not because that's not a reasonable person standard. Um, so you start to realize that maybe our standards are not reasonable person standards. So my standard for garbage is that it goes out every half an hour. And so I had to sit down with Seth and say, you know what? You don't know the story about me, that I didn't have a garbage can growing up, that I had a disabled brother. I was a latchkey kid. My mother worked nights. He would ask for water. I'd go in, Ronnie, to our kitchen. I'd turn on the lights. The cockroaches and water bugs would have to scatter first for me to get the water to bring to him and his bed. Um, that's what I remember about garbage. And then Seth was able to say to me when I finally told him the story, well, I had a housekeeper growing up. I've never thought about garbage. I really don't give a shit about garbage. So what happens when you're so divergent over something that has to get done every day? Do you just take it back and say, well, I tried and, and I'm doing the unpaid labor? No, you come up and you invest in a minimum standard of care. And that was garbage goes out once a day with the liner going back in. And, and it was the first time in my life, Ronnie, where it was like Moses parting the Red Sea. It, it, it happened and it's been happening for six years in my house where the garbage <laughs> goes out once a day. And sometimes, yes, we'll check in. Sometimes I'm still passive aggressive if we have a party and I, I will leave the wine bottles like by his bed. But that's why the communication is the third part of our secret formula. And that is that we don't know how to communicate about domestic life. We are lawyers, but we've never learned to communicate about domestic life. And that is ultimately what I talk about in Fair Play. How did we not learn to talk about domestic life. How did we learn to silence ourselves in the most important organization of our lives? And it is a shame and we can't live like that anymore. So it's time that we use our voices. Um, and, and that's that, and fair play is about how you do that. I'll give you the, thri the, three, th the three step quick um, cliff notes, which is what I found about communication is that um, we say we don't do it. But then there's a very high power uh, executive told me that when her partner forgets to put laundry in the dryer, uh, she dumps it on uh, their pillow. Um, so I'm here to tell you that you're already communicating about domestic life. I'm asking for a shift, not a start. And then finally, the feedback in the moment, well, I've learned now as a mediator, I say this to my clients, feedback in the moment is always toxic. And so we have to invest in our communication like we're investing in toilet paper, hand sanitizer, we have to start looking at it as a, a communication as a practice. Yeah, and, it, and you actually have a, a day of the week you suggest. You think, Friday, you know, I, my husband and I always had our family meetings on Sundays and you actually suggest from your research and your beta testing, Friday is better. Right, well, people hate each other by Sunday. <laughs> um, so I always found that Sunday, well, some, you know, if Sunday works for you, that's great. Um, Friday has been the most successful day of the week for our thousands of beta testers who have given me their, their, their feedback now over 10 years. Um, but Seth and I actually, during the pandemic, we moved to a 10 minute a night check-in mm -hmm. over tequila or cookie dough. That's why I don't fit into any of my clothes and I'm still wearing lots and lots of stretchy pants. Um, I think it was too much Ben and Jerry's, but the, the, the communication practice, our, our 10 minute night check-in, and I will ask how many of you have that. And again, if you're a single parent, um, you can start checking with your children uh, pretty early on about what their responsibilities um, are in the, in the home in terms of the ownership mindset. 
Um, but that 10 minute night check-in, Ronnie, was, has been the key to um, the fair play system for so many. Um, it's the practice of saying, we don't wanna be here. We just wanna get on our devices or watch Netflix, but we will commit to 10 minutes a night. For people who say they don't have the time, give me your screen time app. I will show you how I can take 10 minutes from your Instagram scrolling to, uh, to, to find, to invest in your partnership. But we don't do it. We don't look at communication as a practice, especially lawyers. We were obsessed with thinking of communication as a means to an end, to argue, to get something. So especially lawyers had a hard time when I said, what if I told you that communication is just a practice, a more important practice than exercise or meditation? Um, it's not the way we've been trained to, to think about communication. Uh, we think of it as a means to an end. So I'm here to tell you lawyers that that may be okay in our profession, but that um, in our home, communication is a practice. Um, I wanna make sure we get to some questions. And one of the ones that's come up a few times um, in the, the chat and in um, submitted questions was, what about co-parenting when you're divorced? And how does, your, how does your system of fair play work when you're actually no longer in that committed relationship? It's a great question. And, and to lawyers here who are family lawyers or who work in, part, or in law firms, I mean, I, why, again, why I love to talk to lawyers, I wanna just address one thing, which is um, the law, law firms are inherently set up for uh, discrimination because we've literally discriminated flexibility into um, the structure of a law firm, of, of counsel and partnership. We make women bleed for flexibility. Statistically, women are the ones who take the of counsel roles more than men and is wrong. So if you're a leader in a law firm, I'm here to call you out and say it's wrong. It is wrong. Um, and we have to figure out how we restructure law firms to, um, to not make it inherently unfair to people with caregiving responsibilities. So that's one, that's an aside. But in terms of co-parenting, it's so funny you just said that because I was just on a phone and I don't usually do this, but it was so interesting to me. Um, a friend said, look, I, 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 will you talk to my judge? I've never, I really don't do that. I don't interfere in people's family court hearings, but I was on a Zoom with a judge um, this week and it was for a friend who um, was arguing for more child support and she said, the court has no idea that I do this. They basically said something funny, like, well, you're sitting around eating bonbons all day because your kids are in school. Yeah. And so it was so sexist, um, this judge, and the way they were talking about uh, her life as a, a, a flexible consultant, whereas her partner, you know, her ex-partner is has some big job and doesn't want to pay her more child support. And, um, and so I went through with the judge each and every one of the cards wow. in the conception and planning and execution that it took. And I have a, there, on fairplaylife.com, you will see, you can go and see the cards. If you click on a card, you will see the entire breakdown of what it means to conceive, plan, and execute. And the bottom has a minimum standard of care prompt for you. So I've done all the work for you, but I went into, I just sat there and just read. I read into the record, gifts for families, you know, gestures of love for kids. Here's what that means fun and playing, here's what that means and the time it takes, managing extended family, uh, discipline and screen time for kids, birthday celebrations for your children. And I kept going and going and going. So what I'm here to say is that co-parenting is really, really difficult. Um, and often that's when we see the most interesting difference in our values and our minimum standards of care. We often divorce over those things. So for example, the homework card becomes a really big one. Homework's getting done in one house, homework's not getting done in the other house. Dishes, not such a big deal anymore. Garbage, not such a big deal anymore because you don't live in the same home. Extended family, how they you treat um, your family versus their family. Uh, homework, bathing and grooming. Do you bring home the clothes? Why do you keep leaving all the or underwear at your home? Um, th there are different cards that become in play when you become a co-parent. But customizing your defaults of your minimum standard of care, I believe becomes even more important in a co-parenting situation and even more important if you're fighting for, um, for child support. Yeah, and, we, um, and that minimum standard of care keeps coming up. And I, I think it's, it's worth noting how you talk about it in your book about 
there may be times, and 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 someone uh, mentioned too that it it works the other way. Sometimes um, women might reassess their standards when um, their partners are involved in setting out those ideals and thinking through them and wondering if maybe maybe they're wrong. I give you one last story. Um, and then if we can, I don't know if we can, it's possible to put in the chat, but it's just, let me see if I can put in the chat um, where the, li the list of all the tasks are. Um, so let me just try to do that really quickly. Yeah, sure. Well, while you're doing that, Eve, we can, I can tee up a, you know, um, that, and then um, we have Here a we are. questions Here about law firms and returning to work and uh, paying remote workers less. The idea that that uh, might be Yes. Less. So I will first, let me just address this one quick story about women's a perfectionist. Okay. Cause I want to address that. Okay. So this is a really quick 30 like a minute story. Um, but, uh, so a couple came to me. It's so cool. Um, I love hearing from people who have implemented the system. Uh, so the, they, the, um, this is a hetero cisgender couple. I'll call them, um, let's just call them Joe and Irene. So Irene comes to me and says, um, Joe wanted to take over magical beings. And I was like, okay, that's a hard card to take over, right? Magical beings. We talked about that a little earlier. Uh, so he wanted to be the tooth fairy. They, they onboarded into the system. So they understood the importance. The minimum standard of care for them was no glitter pillow picture frame. It was just literally a dollar or five bucks under the pillow. Um, they Tooth comes along, I think, you know, whatever, for a se second child. Um, and guess what happens, right? Predictably, Joe forgets to put the money under the pillow. So here's the great part. The great part is pre-fair play, what Irene said was that she would have said, I will never trust you again. Verbal assassin, back to the feedback in the moment. You're the worst father that's ever existed. You've ruined our children's memories. Uh, she did not do that. Um, but what was even better was because they were the customized defaults, Joe took ownership and said, my bad. He said in the past, he would have blamed Irene for not uh, <laughs> reminding him to put the money under the pillow. So he says, my bad, I messed up. I will rectify it. I will carry through my mistake. So she says, no feedback in the moment. I will hold my tongue. I will wait for you to carry through your mistake. So he emails toothfairy at gmail.com. And here's the weird part. Someone responds and says, <laughs> I was running backlogged. I don't have your, um, your tooth because I had too many kids to get to last night. But here's the beauty. You get double the money if I come the second night. And so Joe put double the money under his child's pillow the next night. And he said he's never, you know, never will forget to, the, to put the money under the tooth fairy again. But also he had the space to, to know his role and make a mistake in the house. And, and I know it sounds so small, but those stories are the ones that make me happiest because it shows that the dynamic is changing, that men understand they have a fundamental role in raising their children and that they're not blaming their partners for forgetting to remind them. That's conception and planning. And so that's I just a quick story about perfectionism that I thought was really that was really funny to me. No, I think that's really helpful. And uh, you talk about um, the the difference between delegation of tasks and really owning it. And you also talk a little bit about this. And I think this is an important one, especially for women to hear about letting rats in the house. You want to talk about yeah. rats? <laughs> so um, nagging was a term I always hated because it sounded too gendered for me. So I had to come up with a new term. And I realized I kept calling it the random assignment of a task which had a great acronym because you don't want your home infested in rats. This is where fair play is a love letter to men. Um, men are in a situation where they are often telling me that they hate home life because they don't know their role. They can't get anything right. And that is the system's failure we see at work if we delegate just, delegate just execution. Psychological safety comes from an ownership mindset in the workplace as well. So for men, it was understanding that that execution alone was things like my friend in White Plains who said he was getting divorced over a glue stick. We can spend a whole other, uh, we'll do a follow-up session just on the glue stick <laughs> session, but the idea of picking up a glue stick in the middle of your day with no context, with no buy-in, is what you get when you say things like, that's how you get my wife does all these unnecessary things. 
And that's how you get what I call the rat fuck, which is the random assignment of a task. The more you can hand over the full extracurricular sports ownership mindset versus go hand in this random piece of paper at three o'clock at some office. I'm telling you that is a rat that is not empowering. And often that person is going to forget. This comes up a lot in same-sex couples as well because same-sex couples were not, they are better at having conversations, but you are not averse to thinking of the gender division of labor as a money issue. So often in same-sex couples, the person who made less money was getting more invisible work and also getting more rats. So this is something that the ownership mindset can benefit any family structure. That's really helpful to think about. Another question came in about how do you negotiate the value assigned to various tasks? So for example, if someone's holding cards dealing um, with a certain set of things, and you talk a little bit about daily grind, everyone's got to get some of those. But if there, if you say the, the, the cards you hold are inherently less valuable, are those the types of conversations you hear come up? Um, in 100%. Your and they always come up around spirituality and thank you notes. Always, <laughs> always. Oh my God, they're going to church again. Oh my God, there's another thank you note going out. Like I'm not doing those. Um, that's the beauty of this game is um, what I love about it is if you don't feel like, you know, you're ready to do who does what, or you don't want to enter the big system. What, I, what I've been doing, which has been so fun, especially for people who are about to get married. Um, Cause I was doing some fun workshops with the knot and the wedding wire and stuff is you just pull out cards and you just start telling your, your stories of what you remember about them. And the reason why I say that is because then you start seeing the value of them. Teacher communication. That was something that was not um, valuable to, to, to Seth. Like, why are you always in contact with the teachers? And then we just start to talk about like, do you remember a time where your parents ever had to talk to your teacher? And then I remember telling Seth the story about Miss Hornstein in third grade. And I remember she had to call my mother because Alton Smith called me fat. And you know, you just start having these amazing conversations and they become so rich about the fact that you recognize that invisible work is actually what shapes you as a human. This is your humanity, special needs and mental health. I remember we pulled this card once and I got to tell my, my, my husband about what it was like to you know, have a, 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 an undiagnosed autistic brother where everybody just thought he was weird or that he would just grow out of it but he couldn't read and how um, as a child, I had no voice in helping him and it was just getting worse and, and stressful. So, you know, the conversations around garbage, um, tell your stories, tell your stories. It's a very, very helpful way to recognize that there's value in all of the cards. Um, and we don't really recognize until we say things like, well, who taught you to ride a bike? Yeah. Um, who taught you, uh, how, how to fly fish or, you know, that's one of the cards in formal education. Um, who taught you to shave, self-care, uh, grooming. So that's what I would say is that there are some cards that are inherently not valuable for Seth and me. It was thank you notes. We do not send thank you notes. We announce gratitude out loud. Thank you for coming to our party. Um, <laughs> and for the gifts you brought us, we will be donating them mostly, most likely. So you're helping our kids become more generous, we will not be sending you a note in the mail. Um, why do you talk, uh, tell people, we had a question come up about um, someone whose husband is taking more parental leave and taking on the lion's share of domestic duties during COVID, but he's not finding the same support networks that women tend to, and we do. I mean, and you see this in, uh, I belong to a number of Facebook groups and Mamas is a great Facebook group we're co-sponsoring event with on June 30th. and that really can support women in terms of professionally and where do, where do you buy a trunk for camp or who has a great housekeeper, those types of things. And I don't see that same kind of support for the hundreds of cards and any of the ones that men are holding. A hundred percent. And I think it's very isolating to be a stay-at-home um, father in America. Um, I will say of all family structures, stay-at-home fathers and hetero cisgender relationships do get the most leisure time of any group. So I will say a lot of women are still working or doing a lot of the conception and planning still. So I'm, I don't feel too bad for stay-at-home dads because of that reason. But I will say that there are, I, I work closely with a really wonderful organization called Fathering Together. And they now have Facebook groups in every single city 
um, or very or big cities. I'm not sure they're in rural America yet. Um, but I will say that um, Brian Anderson is doing some really wonderful work in this issue. So I would just Google fathering together. They have a dad's 2.0 conference. That's really wonderful. And, um, and I think it's really a moral imperative now uh, for men who are in those roles to also step up as leaders, to say this work is valuable because that's how we get men involved. When we see more men and their stories for why they chose to value the invisible work of childcare and, and housework. And I will say even my most, my most uh, previously sexist men who would say things to me like I'm the CEO outside the home and my wife's the CEO of the home, things I wanna like throw up. Um, one of those men, he started taking the medical and healthy living card for his kids. Uh, so he takes in the pediatrician, he's parenting out loud as I asked him to do um, and, and telling the people who work for him that he's doing it. And then he sent me this note that his child, the family sent me this note that his child sent to him, which says, I love you so much for when you take care of me and, and Sam and when you hold our hands at the doctor. I mean, this is why we're doing this stuff. I mean, if we've learned anything from the pandemic, it's that um, an hour that holding our child's hand at the pediatrician's office should be just as valuable to society as an hour in the boardroom. Yeah, well said. Um, one more question, and then I want you to talk about, um, which I think is really, really important, reclaiming your unicorn space. So um, we have a question about how do you fairly divide tasks if you have a partner who may have um, ADD or is um, not uh, typical in terms of CPE function? So the, the, some of that concept, conception and planning may be difficult. So it's ADHD, um, I, I, and I've done a lot of research now into this, I mean, by asking psychologists who work for, with people who have ADHD. Um, th there, so there is um, real ADHD and there's also male malingering. So first we have to figure out which, which one it is. So there has been a, um, there's just been a lot of conditioning. I can't do this. You're so much more competent than me. Um, that is, that's often been because the work is not valuable. So what a lot of psychologists will say is you have to first recognize, is this partner somebody who can actually do something start to finish in their workplace or somewhere else? If they can't and they really have full ADHD, then obviously um, they are, you know, not, um, you know, in, in as in, in inherent position to understand the conception and planning, but that's why the conversations and the communication is so much more important. But I will say that that gets conflated a lot. Um, so my main question is, is that person able to handle start, tasks from start to finish in other aspects of their lives? And if they are, then this is probably not an ADHD issue. It's probably a value of women's time issue and that we don't value childcare and domestic work. Again, like the men I was talking about before who said, there's no way I would ever be able to choose what tuxedo to buy or suits so my wife just does it for me. I'm, you know, it's too many options. I'm overwhelmed. Now, you, like you, you can buy your own underwear. Yeah, you can yeah. buy your own underwear. So um, we have a couple minutes left, and I, I wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to talk about the real value of this, which is both partners in a relationship, or if someone's an individual, getting that unicorn space, and and you define that so well as something that really is usually outside of your work, but that is fulfilling and that represents a passion to you. So can you briefly touch on that before we, we say goodbye? Fine, thank you. I just handed my manuscript for my book, Find Your Unicorn Space. So I, 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 this concept so important, I decided to write a whole book about it um, that's coming out in January. And the book is really addressing the intersection of our identity as women, um, our ability to be seen beyond our roles, um, our, and our permission to ask for what we need. And so what often happens uh, to women after we become the three Ps, uh, parents, partners, and professionals, um, there's no time left for anything else. And I'm here to tell you, it's actually subversive. It is subversive for women to spend time on ourselves. And I don't mean self-care or commodified wellness. I don't mean, oh, I got a blowout at dry bar. I'm talking about eudaimonic well-being which is linked to our mental health and our physical health. Men uh, in hetero cisgender relationship, their physical health is most linked to whether they're married or not. That's Robert Waldinger's study 
um, and they're good quality of their relationships. Yes, for women, it's more complicated. The active pursuit of what makes us us in the context of spiritual friendships and support is a key piece of our mental health. So what do I mean by that? I mean, eating a pie, like I said, has sort of been my MO for my self-care in the pandemic. Baking a pie activates a different part of the brain um, and has shown to be that creativity, that flow state, uh, uninterrupted attention and time for sustained attention for things that we love to do is highly subversive. And so I call that unicorn space because like the mythical equine, it doesn't fucking exist for women unless we reclaim it. And so often it is uh, very different. I have women who are uh, volunteer firefighters to uh, baker, gluten-free bakers who put their pies into competitions to dog portraitists, all who have day jobs. Um, for me, it is the gender division of labor is my unicorn space as well as dance. And I, I think it is so important for us to start thinking about what makes us us and how do we share that with the world? And if we don't know that outside our three Ps, that's fine, again, because it's highly subversive to spend that time that's unpaid for us in that way, but it, it is key to our uh, mental health. Well, Eve, speaking of time, we are about out and I want to thank you so much for sharing yours with us today because um, this is a, an incredibly valuable conversation and thank you for sharing your expertise and your passion with us. Um, we are so appreciative. And Ronnie, I want to take you on the road because thank you and your interns. You had beautiful, hard questions that I don't always get to delve, dive into. Thank you all. Your time is diamond. So thanks for staying with us uh, long. And, um, you know, if anybody ever wants to reach out to me, you can always find me on Instagram. We answer DMs. I'm on Eve Rodsky at Instagram. And I, I sent I sent out the CPE checklist in the chat. Yes. Thank you all so much for joining us. Eve, I will take you up on that offer. We will talk more. Yeah. And thank you all for joining the Center for Women in Law. Um, please be sure to join us on June 30th as we partner with Mamas Austin to talk about re-entering the workforce and bridging the career gap. Um, you can follow us on all of our social media and check us out at Center for Women in Law, our website. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.